Good day, Thompson. First of all, let me thank you for agreeing to do this video interview with me today over Zoom. Absolutely. Uh, I'm actually pretty excited about uh, participating in this, and uh, I think it's going to be a good time. Well, very cool. For our audience, would you please introduce yourself, give us your name, and then tell us a little bit about where you grew up. Yep. So my name is Thompson Charles. Uh, I am from Miami, Florida. Um, first generation American. Uh, my background, my parents are from Haiti. And, uh, and so I've been able to kind of come out here and, and learn and kind of really, you know, embody a lot of what they believe to be the American dream. Very cool. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about where you went to school, what, uh, where you went to college and what you studied? Yeah, for sure. Um, I, have, I went to uh, Southeastern University for undergrad and grad school. Um, and I got my master's degree in educational leadership, currently uh, working on my doctorate degree from North Central in organizational leadership. Cool. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about uh, what, where you live now, what, what kind of work you do? Yeah, so right now I live in Charlotte, North Carolina. Um, I actually uh, started a company called Investy Solutions, um, which focuses on developing uh, learning materials for uh, child and family agencies and organizations and businesses. Uh, we have a learning management system that we create course content and we can house um, training for agencies to track and report on their learning. Um, it's, been a, it's been a really exciting adventure to, to watch some of our companies kind of grow and develop and uh, take advantage of some of our resources. Well, very cool. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, some of the more interesting work that you've uh, done over your career? Yeah, and so um, over the, last, over the last, I would say, decade, last 10 years or so, a lot of time has been spent um, doing some organizational restructuring, uh, working directly with uh, employees and supervisors, um, teaching them you know, a lot of uh, how to uh, better support their staff, um, and a lot of uh, kind of organizational restructuring, um, aligning the agency with the strategic plan. Um, and the idea is so that they can uh, you know, kind of survive into, into what at the time was called um, 2020, right? But now we're in 2020, so it's, it's kind of cool to think 10 years later, here we are. Um, I've also been involved in, a, in managing learning, uh, you know, managing, uh, learning management systems, as well as, as uh, creating uh, content and then doing a lot of research for uh, the companies that have supported. Very cool. Can you tell us a little bit about your first exposure to what I call human performance technology or evidence-based practices for performance improvement or however you refer to it? Yeah, so, so when I first came, got introduced to um, human performance, it, 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 it's kind of an unconventional way. I, I'm very self-taught, right? No one came to me and said, Thompson, this is uh, professional development. This is how we train and develop. Nobody told me that, right? And so um, I, I really had a passion for learning and I, I came across um, a woman by the name of Chimamanda Adichie who had a TED talk called The Danger of a Single Story. And in her TED talk, she talks about how oftentimes we judge people and places based on those first experiences. And so we have this single story of, of a group of people or a single story of, of the people we're serving. And if we don't you know, expand that view, then what happens is we, we never really get to appreciate all that those people or that thing really has to offer. Um, and then as, as I've kind of continued to grow, um, I came across the, uh, this, this term transformational learning, which is something I'd never heard of before. And I started to learn about it. I found out who Jack Mesereau was. And, and he had the same kind of philosophy, which was if, if you only approach things based on what you know, Right, and you and you close out all the different ideas, and you and you shut the door to 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 different um, ideologies, or or somebody else may have a different view. Maybe they're maybe culturally they may experience it differently than you do, um, and sometimes even experience. Right, so I may see it based on my experience in one way, but somebody has more experience, and I have to be in essence available or willing to sort of learn, and and in essence transform. Kind of how I view the work. And so combined, um, both of them have really kind of um, unlocked my mind in terms of one, how I approach learning, but also it, it uh, influenced how I approach staff development. Um, it influenced how I approach um, even corporate learning and strategic planning. 
And so it, it, it's, a, it's been a really exciting journey to go from, you know, thinking you know things a certain way and then kind of every day, the more people you meet and the more books you read and magazines you read, uh, just kind of expanded my, you know, knowledge around how people learn. Great. That's a great segue into my next question, which is uh, some of your biggest influences besides those that you just, the two that you just mentioned here, but are there people, articles, or books that, uh, that uh, were influential to you, important to you, and that you would maybe suggest that others might want to follow up with them? Yeah. And you know what? I would say that there are three, um, three big influences. Um, two, I think are really, really popular. Uh, one, if you know, heard of Simon Sinek, um, he is, you know, a guru anthropologist who is big on, you know, you know, why, le you know, how leaders lead and leaders eat last and that sort of thing. And one of the videos that I watched from him was how great leaders inspire action. And, and that video um, probably was, was like very, very um, influential into kind of me following him because I, I never knew who he was before I saw that YouTube video. And, and I just kind of, my, my world just kind of like, like seeing her uh, a sunrise, I guess. It was just like, man, this guy just is making leadership and learning just make sense. Um, the, the, the second is Peter Singh, who uh, wrote the book, The Fifth Discipline. Um, and it's really about looking at a very systematic approach. Um, I do have the book and the, the field guide. And I still use them <laughs> regularly. I go back in and I refresh myself all the time on sections and chapters. Um, every time I take on a new project, I always reference it. I take it with me everywhere, all the time. Um, so I recommend that to any and everybody, you know, buy that book, buy the workbook, uh, keep it with you. Um, and then third is, may, may or may not be as popular, is a, a book called The Servant by James Hunter. Um, in this book, it is a... Uh, it's written sort of as a narrative. It's, it's, it's nonfiction, it's his story, but it's written in a way where he talks about how he wanted to learn how to lead, but he, went, he, learned, he learned it from monks, right? And so um, in this book, The Servant, the, there's a tagline, I guess, or a quotation that's mentioned in here that, I, that, stays, that stays with me. And it is, all of us together is wiser than one of us alone. And so for about three years, um, that was the tagline on my email. Um, every time I went to a training, um, I would always tell everybody, I would facilitate some staff meeting or I facilitate some meeting. Um, and I would, I would say to my staff, um, I am not the smartest person in the room. I don't need to be. <laughs> and, and that book has actually released me from feeling like I have to have all the answers and I got to know what to do all the time and, and, say, and say, hey, how do we collaborate with our teams? How do we teach people to think for themselves? And so uh, basically empowering your staff and empowering your leaders to, to work and then come back. You know? And so I think that you know, those three books, you know, the, the Fifth Discipline by Peter Singh, the, the Servant by James Hunter, and Anything by Simon Sinek, I think uh, are, are probably like really influential um, material. Thank you for sharing that. If you were to give us a 30 second elevator speech on what you currently do, what would that be? Yeah, and so Investing Solutions uh, was created uh, with the vision to add value to everything, right? I remember when I first mentioned, I told you about this, you know, we really have a strong belief um, that we don't need more campaigns. What we need is more people who care and we at Investing Solutions really care about the future. And so what you'll see from us uh, is we provide training uh, to new hires, to new leaders and aspiring leaders. Uh, we provide course library and custom content uh, to take the aggravation and guesswork out of compliance training. Uh, we provide a learning management system to track and report employee learning um, and their professional development. And we partner with, an organ with organizations to support the strategic plan. So, so these are, this is what Invested Solution does. Well, very cool. So tell us a little bit more about the, the, the customer base that you work with uh, and you're providing these learning services and, and your uh, learning management system. Yep. Who, who are these and uh, what, what part of the market is this? Yep, so, so, so we work with, with a, a big emphasis has been with child and family agencies. Um, a lot, you know, there are, there are a lot of group homes and foster care agencies that do not have the training and the learning um, it is also an industry that has exceedingly high turnover. 
um, both in leadership and in direct care. And so, so they became my primary target audience because I have spent um, over 10, 12 years working with residential programs um, and working with residential leaders. And so we, we, cut, we can, we've come alongside of them. Um, we've been, uh, I don't want to use the word uh, nursing them, but we've basically been sort of nursing them back to health. Uh, one of the agencies we're working with now, they've been in business for about 20 years. Um, and so they're ready to do something different. And so they contracted with us. And so, so we want to propel them for the next 20 years. Um, and then we recently um, paired with uh, another agency who's been, a, who's been in business for about eight to 10 years. Um, and so they, they're wanting to, they're wanting to uh, beef up their training. They want to, you know, beef up their leaders. Um, and so we've been with, with a couple of these couple of companies has been uh, training their leaders specifically not in just doing what you always do and always have known to do, um, but really looking at the workforce is different. Millennials and, and Gen Zers are coming into the workforce. So, so the days of somebody you know, uh, applying to your job and going to stay there for 30 years um, is you got to look at that differently, right? And so what we're doing is, is working with these agencies to say, you know, you're bringing in people who who may come in and say, I'll, I'm not even going to give you a year. I'm going to come in. I just need some experience. You know, what can you teach me? What can you, how can you help me and support me? And then it's kind of send me off on my way to be better <laughs> than when I came. Um, and so, so I'm, I'm really taking a, a, a philosophy around, you know, if we, if we don't train your employees and your leaders the right way, you, you might keep people for a long time, but they're not going to be effective, you know, but the other part about that is we, we try to support them and say, hey, you know what? Um, they are the external relations. They are the ones who are going to recruit their friends to come back. So if we really invest in them, then when, then when they leave and, and move on in their careers, it's not about, man, um, we're losing a great staff. It's really about, hey, we really developed somebody for the field. And you, you also mentioned uh, compliance. So does, does what you offer them standard compliance courses that they need and, and you're just kind of brokering that to them? Right. And so what we've done is um, specifically every state has their own compliance regulations, right? Their own licensing requirements. And so, so what we do is, is uh, we, research, we research for that state what we need. Um, for North Carolina, we are very familiar on the licensing requirements for level three group homes and um, in order to be uh, in compliance with the Division of Mental Health uh, Substance Abuse um, and DHSR, Division of Service Regulation in North Carolina. And so we're very familiar. And what we've done is we've actually packaged the courses that, that you need in order to be in compliance. What we want to do is take all the guesswork out of it, right? And so, mm -hmm. so they, we, when they, when they, come, when they come, you know, contract with us, we give them those 13 courses. And then what we do is we, we customize everything else, all the professional development. Um, and, and like I said before, we also have a custom library to support some of that professional development as well for those employees. So not only does an employee come in and say, hey, I'm, I'm gonna come in and do the basics for compliance, but they're coming in on a trajectory. What we wanna do is identify for that specific staff person, what are the specific needs for them? How do we tailor a plan for them so that we in essence will create a learning organization? Back to Sangi, yeah. Yes. So, <laughs> so as a lifelong learner, uh, I mean, you, you talk about your desire for learning. So what's your current focus for yourself? What are you attempting to learn? And are you doing any writing about that? Yeah, so I am a lifelong learner. You know, I've been, I, I love learning. Um, actually, and that's actually why I came into the field in the first place. Uh, when I uh, first started working uh, with, with, with in, I worked in, I've worked in hospitals, I've worked with residential programs. Um, and when I first started, you know, it was always about moving to another position. I was always felt like I had to go up the corporate ladder because there's something that you would learn, right? Learn, learn, learn. Well, I, I quickly realized that my passion was about, I loved learning. And when I kind of, when I got into the talent development space, I was like, man, information is like limitless. And the more you learn about something, the more you realize there's so much more to learn about that thing, right? And so, and so... So, so right now, as I've been learning a lot about leadership and learning a lot about turnover, um, I am currently doing a lot of researching and learning about abusive supervision practices. Um, and I'm, as, as I, said, I think I mentioned in the beginning is that I am a doctoral student. And so part of that is, is I'm trying to do a lot of research around understanding how abusive supervision influences 
uh, employee burnout. Um, I'm also thinking about like, there's this theory called conservation of resources theory, which is basically there are resources that we all innately want to conserve. For some people, it's money. For others, it's their sanity, right? And so if, if you know, we all been there where we try to understand why people <coughs> leave, right? We always say, you know, why do they leave? There's, there's always some type of, you know, exit summary, somebody resigns or something like that. But very rarely do we try to figure out why people stay. You know what I mean by that? And so if we could figure out why people stay, we can also kind of look at how, you know, how people um, become citizens of their employer, right? So some looking at that organizational citizenship behavior and that kind of people's willingness to share information. And so if the supervisor um, uses abusive supervision practices, which is perceptive, right? Based on if I believe that they're being abusive to me, then, then what's gonna keep me at the job? You know, because if I'm being, if, if it's just the paycheck, then some people will say, well, they're not paying me enough to deal with all this foolishness and they'll go. Whereas other people may say, you know what, the value that I bring is more important than the paycheck that I'm receiving. And so I think, you know, I really want to look at how conservation of resources oftentimes mitigates the, the fact that people want to leave, you know, leave their jobs. And so if we can, if we can build that and understand why people stay, I think we can kind of ultimately change the workforce and how people view work. Excellent, thank you. Let me shift gears here a little bit. Uh, our terminology in the field of talent development, learning and development is uh, kind of messy, but is there a favorite performance improvement term or phrase that you would like to define for us? And I bring this up because perhaps you feel there's a term or a phrase that's misused, misconstrued, and, and so what would you share with us? So. So as I'm thinking about this, and this is as early as yesterday, um, I realized there's actually two words, but one, you're asking for one, and, and one word is accountability. Um, oftentimes, people view accountability as writing them up, right? And, you know, somebody needs to be held accountable, so that means that somebody needs to get fired for this, right? But accountability to me, right? I'm not gonna do a formal definition, but for me, accountability is about the support that people need in order to get things done. So if I have to do something, um, I have a, a hard, a, 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 there's a quote by a person named Craig Rochelle that says, the difference between where you are and where you wanna be is something that you don't know, right? So if we want a staff person or a supervisor to be able to, per to perform at a certain level, Right? And we want to hold them accountable to performing at that level. It doesn't mean we write them up because they're not performing at that level. It means what supports do they need in order to be able to perform at that level. Right? And, so, and so accountability, I would say, is the term um, that I think it's misconstrued because a lot of people look at accountability as simply writing somebody up and firing them, not as giving them the tools that they need or, in essence, identifying the needs gap and then be able to fill it so that that person can be successful. Thank you, very good. Uh, let's uh, re perhaps revisit what we've somewhat covered, but I wanted to explore a little bit more about the people who've influenced you regarding your early practices in the business. And uh, you might wanna do a shout out uh, to some people that uh, were uh, helped you along the way or other people that may be more well known yep. from the industry, but uh, um, so who, who are, let's go a little bit deeper in terms of, you know, who they are and, and what your takeaways, what your learnings were from them. Yeah, so, so there, there are a couple of people that, 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 I, that came to mind. Um, uh, one is, uh, and they were all leaders over me, right? They're all leaders. You know, I'm a firm believer. People don't quit jobs. They quit their leaders. I, I support that philosophy too, right? And one is, is a person by the name of Will. Um, he was a visionary. He was very cutthroat. Uh, he was the guy who said, hey, I need this by uh, five o'clock, close the business. Well, Will, it's like 4.30, <laughs> you know? And so there was definitely like a sense of urgency there, um, and which, I, which, which made sure that I knew that he was always going to ask for something. So I wanted to make sure that I was always prepared, you know, ahead of time, right? I, was, I never procrastinated on something working for him because, you know, if, 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 uh, if it was late, it was a problem. Um, 
And then there's a, another person who also very influential for me in this in the helping profession, which was um, in the training space, is don't. His name is Jesse, and uh, he used to tell me, "Don't solve it for them, right? Um, let them figure it out." And and for me, I was solution oriented. The reason why we come into this is because we want to, we don't want people to struggle. We want them to to learn it, do well, succeed, and move on. Um, but he said he's don't don't solve it for them. Um, let them let them figure it out and then give them feedback along the way, which is really helpful. Um, there is a person, um, he is a culture architect. I love this guy, his name is Tony Moore. Um, and uh, he does consulting work. And, and he was always into, there's always something that you can learn. In every situation, you can reflect. And even when you think that there's nothing you can learn, reflect on what you learned about yourself, right? And so, so that was, hands down, very, very um, influential in my life. Um, and then lastly, a, a very, very, very close and good friend of mine named Erica, who in light of every sort of dominant type A personality that we have like in the world, you have to have somebody who knows how to nurture. Um, and she was a nurturer. And um, she showed me that you can be stern, but you can also appreciate people. Right, that it's okay if somebody if someone fails, it's okay, right? You don't have to come down on them, you don't have to be on them. Um, but she definitely showed me that you can appreciate uh, what people bring to the table, even though those differences um, are different than yours, right? She is not an extrovert, she is an introvert, uh, but she was a I would consider her like a quiet leader, right? Where she can influence and make change and never have to raise her voice or scream at you or yell at you or anything like that. But you recognize because she's caring and compassionate that that you know you you'll listen to her. I don't explain that better. <laughs> you know what I mean? And so Will, Tony, Jesse, and Erica are probably the most uh, influential people um, who I think kind of keep me on on a very straight and narrow path down this you know learning journey. Thank you for sharing that, Thompson. Thanks so much for uh, participating with me in this video interview. My final question is, do you have any parting words of wisdom or guidance for our audience, especially those who are new to the field, uh, related to all things performance improvement wise? Yeah, I mean, if I had to, you know, sum it up into, I'd say three words, those three words would be never stop learning. Um, there's always something to learn, um, something, somebody to learn from, somebody who can influence you. Um, I think it's in incredibly important to be teachable and coachable. Um, I used to have a friend that, that, that uh, when I was an undergrad who said to me, you can never take someone somewhere you've never been before. And in the learning space, I think we, we want to we create learning organizations. We want to create professionals who, who learn. But if you're not a learner, it's not realistic that you're going to be able to, to teach somebody how to take ownership of their own learning. So, so that's what I would say. Um, to anybody kind of coming into this field and, and even some seasoned veterans who are, are uh, continuing to progress to never stop learning, you know, look for the opportunity to learn in every situation. Very good advice. Again, Thompson, thanks so much for doing this with me today. You have a great day. Hey, thank you so much.